our state and our university are going through right now. Um, we realize that this is a challenging economic time and that the government has had to make a bunch of cuts and make some really hard decisions and our university has to do that also. We're not talking about 5% here or 11%, we're talking about 13% over the next biennium. Oh, 13 each year, that's 26%, it's already gone up 81%, that's too much. And we know that, that, that all of us are sacrificing, we know that the administration you know, has, is on a pay freeze right now, but you've got demographics like me who didn't have any parental support or any family support. You have demographics like friends from other nations who are coming here to study because of the quality of our education, and yet you can't pay rent. We are having a hard time dealing with is the fact that students like me who are from uh, lower income families who have had to work really hard <laughs> and buy my pants at Goodwill and <laughs> for four or six years now it'll be that I've been working on my education. I'm one of those non-traditional students who went back to school um, three years ago and I'm finally finishing up um, and applied for graduate school at Portland State so hopefully uh, that'll work out. I am a first generation college student majoring in human development and minoring in sociology. I'm also a former foster youth who has taken 12 years to get to my senior year of college. Um, part of that was because I was being married and a mom. Part of that was because I took three years off to do AmeriCorps VISTA. I mean, even without going to graduate school, I'm going to have about $30,000 in debt. And I applied for every scholarship that I could. Well, I applied for four. I got all four of them that I applied for. So even with scholarships, even with other funding sources, there's just not enough money there. I think really what it boils down to is we're looking at a larger disparity between the richest people and the poorest people. While students might have to make some sacrifices and take some cuts in assistance and schooling and stuff, we feel that the rest of the university should be taking those cuts too. That we should all be bearing the burden of this time together as a team. We're, we're doing all of these things that don't help us as students. It might help them keep their jobs. And I'm really excited that one more administrator gets to keep their job. And I know that it takes a level of administration to run a huge university system. But we've gone too far. The bureaucracy has gone too far, and the only way that we're going to make it better is if all of us are sharing our story. What students are upset about, and what I'm upset about, is that there are people at the top, just like Taj was talking about, that are making so insanely much money that it just... How can that happen? How can that happen? How can that happen? that I'm working three jobs and going to school and doing everything that I have to do just to barely, barely, barely make it and shop at Goodwill and buy in bulk and do everything that I can. And there's a guy that has two houses that are paid for by my tuition. That gets to me. That gets to me. Uh, President Floyd, while I took a $100,000 pay cut, still makes uh, well over $600,000 a year, and that's just his salary. That doesn't include benefits or either of the two residences that the university pays for, uh, both of which are high dollar residences. Uh, and if you, if you talk about, uh, I mean, that's, he makes literally three times what the governor of this state makes. We can't even make it as students. So us students have some demands, and we'd like to voice those. Um, to the administration, and we do appreciate you being here, Lynn, but these are the demands that we as students um, want to really address with you. We want, the equal, we want an equal amount of students on those boards as we do administrators, professors, teachers, and everybody else. Students, have, students are paying the bill. None of us would be here unless students were here. Um, graduated pay cuts. The more you make, the more you're cut which means we start at the top. So those folks that are making 600 grand a year, they need to take the biggest pay cuts. And I'm glad that he voluntarily did take one. You know, that's, that's awesome, and I commend him for it. But we need more. We need not such a large disparity between the very rich and the very poor. We want to equalize tuition increases with the top administrator pay cut. So if the top 11% the top of administrators take an 11% pay cut, 
um, if we have to pay an 11, if we have to pay 11% more in tuition, then we want top administrators to take an 11% pay cut. Um, we want to hold to that agreement until tuition is reasonable and in line with other cost of living variables again, which means that cost of living right now is going up for everybody. People are losing their homes. This whole foreclosure crisis is happening. People can't even find a place to rent right now because there's, there's nowhere to rent. People can't afford to live. And I'm telling you, I'm working with these people every single day. They're living in their cars. That's what America is coming down to. And it's breaking my heart. It's breaking my heart that the people at the very top are making a pile of money while the rest of us are just barely struggling and barely getting by. So those are the issues I have. If anybody else has anything. I have friends who are like the LGBT youth center that I worked at where I have nine kids who are all brilliant and 19 years old and they don't have enough money to live and to go to school because a full financial aid package plus some loans still doesn't cut it in our cost of living. It's not just the pay thing. It's that every single higher level person I've talked to, both at Eastern Washington University where I went before this and here, when I talk about the student experience of cuts, what they say to me, and, and it's been without, um, without exception, that students are apathetic and don't advocate for themselves, that students won't show up for rallies, that students this and students that. And while there's a part of that that's true because when we're students, we're kind of busy being students, and I know that people in general in that higher education get that, but what the administration doesn't get is that you have partners. You have an army of partners. And instead of treating us as partners, administration has treated us like clients and not in a good way. Things are done to us, things are done for us, but things are very rarely done with us. We are educated, we, we better be. <laughs> we are passionate, we have energy. If we didn't have energy, finals week would be way uglier than it already is. And we're the stakeholders, but I don't see that administrators see us as partners. And I don't know that it's one of our official demands, but it sure as hell is one of mine. So, you know, a $100,000 pay cut seems big, but that's minuscule compared to what his overall salary is. And, and, and there's a number, of, a number of places where it seems that, um, I, I think that, that of those thousand classes that have been cut or the programs like the women's studies area here or, uh, you know, women's studies in general and, and Pullman as well, some of that salary, some of that 600 plus thousand could probably easily pay for what students are losing. And I think that's kind of the point that Delaney was getting. There's depth to the argument. Mm -hmm. And that's where you guys really need to start continuing the research and the focus that you're doing. Because mm -hmm. it, it so, gives it so much more power when you have that depth of being able to say, this is what we want, this is why we want it. This our is form for this, our goal for today was simply to say, administrators, what you're doing is not good enough. Part of that is their salaries. I, we disagree with you. We disagree with that's, you. We very fine. carefully crafted that. It's not okay. Part of that is access to the decision making. And mm -hmm. you may disagree with us in that way. That's where we come from as a student group that we all agreed on what was said today were things that we all agreed with. Mm -hmm. And so as student government, you have different priorities. You're managing a different budget. You're managing the activity type things. You're managing student engagement. And yes, it's connected. And yes, we will connect and we will find that common ground. For today, our goal was for them to know that there is a group of more than five students that is not okay with what is happening. Part of that is their salaries. Part of that is access to decision making. Part of that is the other things that you heard today. And to hear some student stories that we know that they know, we know that they get it, but we wanna make sure that they get it and know that we're not just apathetic, we are angry. And I know that anger scares government of all forms. But we are angry, and we want them to know that we are angry. That doesn't mean we're not thinking, and it doesn't mean we're not planning, and it sure as hell doesn't mean that we don't know what we're doing. We're maybe going about it very differently than you on purpose. And I'd like you to consider that. I think, Lydia, all of us would like you to consider that maybe we don't want to go about it in the appropriate channels, because the appropriate channels are very limited. Your point is absolutely right. It is limited. We aren't.